Hello, my name is Joel Dunning from James Cook Hospital. Uh, this is a mega omni lecture of everything. So, uh, we're going to talk lots about the evolution of all types of surgery in thoracics, uh, vats, robotics, evolution of training, the works. So, strap in, get your popcorn, let's get going. So it's kind of crazy to think that in 2012, when I was appointed as a consultant, 4% um, of the UK's uh, lung cancer operations were done by VATS. The rest were done by thoracotomy. Big, huge incisions. Uh, you know, people did fine. But, uh, you know, things have changed so quickly in just 10 years. We were all taught a... a a VATS technique. Uh, I actually learnt the posterior approach with uh, Bill Walker in Edinburgh, where I stood at the back of the patient. Um, the most common technique was by Rene Pettersson and Henrik Hansen, uh, who taught most of Europe the three-port anterior approach. Uh, Rob McKenna in America in 1992, uh, and Bill Walker did the first VATS operations. It didn't exist literally uh, before then, uh, and then the, the mechanical staplers came out. Bill Walker told me once that uh, the reason he started is because a rep said, oh, they're doing it all the time in America. So he thought he'd better have a go. No videos, no ability to quickly have a Zoom call with uh, Rob McKenna. So, so they just cracked on. But uh, the three-port approach uh, gained uh, great and wide acceptance very quickly uh, into, the, uh, into the 2010, 2015 kind of era. But then, like a whirlwind, uh, Diego Gonzalez Rivas came in. Uh, he did his first ever uh, uniportal lobectomy in 2011. He was actually with Tom D'Amico, who was a, an extremely good surgeon in America. He learned with Rob McKenna first. He went to Tom D'Amico. Tom D'Amico actually had a two-port approach. Uh, and, um, and, and Diego improved that to uniportal. Weirdly, um, Tom D'Amico actually still did a uniportal approach, but he just wanted to put the drain away from the wound, so that's why he made one more hole. So really, uh, Tom D'Amico was one of the first uniportalists as well. Uh, but uh, Diego spread the word, uh, increased uh, the volume of people who are engaging with minimally invasive surgery super rapidly. And the really innovative thing he did is he used YouTube and social media to show the world his new techniques. And that's, I believe, why it uh, took off so quickly. So one of them greatest things he did is he engaged with the Shanghai Pulmonary Hospital, the world's biggest thoracic surgery hospital, and they innovated even further with him at their helm. Uh, so currently they do 120 anatomical lung resections per day, 13,000 lobectomies a year in 12 units. And this video is from Zhang Lei. I went to go and see that unit and he was doing sub xiphoid uniportal surgery. So not just uniportal, but uniportal not through any intercostal spaces. And this was the view. It was actually pretty reasonable. Um, uh, it's uh, Giuseppe Aresu is currently doing this in Papworth, although you'll have to go and see him pretty soon as they've just bought a robot, so he may transfer over to robotics. But uh, this is what Zhang Lei was doing. He went and made a whole load of half a meter long instruments. These are 50 centimeters, these instruments, so that his hands can be far enough back through the, from the single incision so that he can perform the operation really nicely. Actually, if you look at the way he's doing this operation, this is a middle lobectomy, it actually doesn't look too bad. He's got round uh, the, the vessels, he's uh, putting some slings around it, he's able to staple, and, uh, you know, he, he made this a very successful procedure. I believe he's done about 500 uh, of these operations, although technically it does seem to be quite difficult to do. I like this little gadget he had. He had a little tester gadget just to test if he could get a stapler around it first of all, uh, and then he passes his stapler uh, through the sub incision. So interestingly, he did every single lobe. He did segments in every side, including the left-hand side. Um, I think in his favor, uh, the Chinese average patient is quite thin and quite young. They do have a lot of GGOs there. But, but really, a very impressive procedure. You can see in the top right corner, modifying how he does some staple firing, stapling upside down, 
taking most of the instruments out, but, but he made it work very nicely. So innovation has been really rife uh, in that surgery uh, over the last decade. So feeling slightly jealous, not wanting to miss out. This is myself in my institution. And I had a little play with something I called microlobectomy. So I wasn't quite good enough to do sub xiphoid uniportal all the time, but I did love that sub xiphoid incision for stapling, removing the sample um, and the drain. Uh, but I felt that I needed a little bit more help. So I just used five mil ports. So this is, these are five mil instruments and a five mil camera. So I did everything using the Copenhagen three port uh, port positioning, but then did the stapling, the drains, and the, 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 the sample removal through a sub xiphoid port, and it wasn't too bad. And uh, really, I'll just show you as an example of innovation. But there were a lot of other people innovating as well uh, around the world. This is Marian Zielinski, probably the most dramatically different technique I've ever seen. Uh, and this is through the neck. So he's got a skyhook lifting the sternum up. That's the sternal notch. You're now going through the neck. And uh, this is the view into the right chest. Have you ever seen anything like this? That's the diaphragm down the bottom there. Uh, and, uh, and there's the, the truncal branch of the pulmonary artery, the trachea. Um, and uh, he, he started this by doing something called TEMLA, Total uh, Endoscopic Mediastinal Lymphadenectomy, taking absolutely every single lymph node out through the neck, so he never made a mistake. And then he saw great views to the right upper lobe. So here's the truncal branch of the right upper lobe. And through the neck, he's just dividing that. He'll next see uh, a, a bronchus, and he'll be able to get to the vein. So he's actually able to do full... Uh, lobectomies. And the really crazy thing is that he could actually do the left hand side as well. Sometimes he did a sub xiphoid incision as well. So this is a camera from the sub xiphoid after he'd finished the procedure. The vein's done, the truncal branch is done, the, the, the right upper lobe bronchus is done. Pretty impressive, hey? One extremely innovative surgeon is Carol Flirty from France. He also really liked the sub xiphoid approach. But just like myself, he felt he needed more than just that one incision to do a good job of an operation on both sides. So he also added a subcostal incision. Uh, this was quite nice. He uses one Alexis port and then he uses a 12 mil uh, port as an introducer to an Alexis port, just firing it in there. That was something that Zhang Lei does as well, which is quite nice. So with two incisions, uh, he got himself a great view. He used a 10 mil camera and he could replicate a really good lobectomy. So I thought that was a really nice innovation. So as I was doing microlobectomy, and here we are putting the five mil ports in, I've got this reusable ones. Here's the sub xiphoid incision. Uh, once I've got CO2 in the chest and three five mil ports, I just made an incision, finger in, always went straight into the chest under vision. And then under vision, I would put a 12 mil port in uh, and the diaphragm was always pushed nicely down by the CO2. So this was a little new innovation that we had. Uh, we'd found the Flex Dex needle holder uh, by a company in America invented by a pediatrician, a pediatric surgeon, in fact. Uh, who really felt he wanted some wristed instrumentation in his practice. And I thought it was really quite nice. We finally got, instead of straight stick surgery, we got wristed instruments for the first time. Now, there are a few disadvantages of this particular instrument, and one was that you had to disconnect yourself from it if you wanted to do anything with that left hand or right hand. So here's me putting a swab in the chest, but I had to do it by disconnecting myself and reconnecting. Obviously you can't have two, because if you have two you can't get out of them. So, so that was a little disadvantage. But here you can see it's quite not too bad for dissecting. Uh, you could actually lift fairly nicely and get the instrument out of the way of your hook diathermy, which wasn't too bad. So here we are just going over the azygous vein. You could actually retract relatively reasonably, uh, curving around uh, things. And then here's us lifting up uh, in the R4 area, just to sort of uh, get into the R4 lymph nodes, which was relatively nice. Obviously, it's a needle holder, and uh, to my knowledge, that's uh, all, all they've got at the moment. 
Uh, but this was really nice. You could get at just the right angle to get around the vein, the perfect angle. So, so you didn't have to choose between a right angled clamp or a Diego dissector, which is 45 degrees, or a lymph node holding forceps, which is 30 degrees. You decide the degrees, which I thought was quite nice. Here's us now going around the artery. So, so going around the trunk or branch, nice blunt tip at exactly the angle that I wanted. So, so wristed instrumentation uh, did seem to be like a really nice innovation. And taking this a little bit further, we thought we'd uh, get a, uh, a camera holder. So this is called the freehand surgical camera holder. You put something on your head, so the head controls the movements of this camera holder. And the one best thing about the freehand surgical camera holder is that it's free. The only thing you pay for is the drapes. So it's about a hundred quid a case. So you nod your head and lift your head and move it around loads. And, uh, and so with a automated camera holder and a flex dex um, instrument, uh, you've got what I call surgeon powered robotics. So, so why did I call it that? Well, I called it that because what does robotics give you? Well, robotics gives you wristed instrumentation and control of your camera. So, so, but this is totally um, reproducible in this fashion. And look what else, I don't have an assistant. So actually you could call this unisurgeon, uh, surgeon powered robotics. And uh, Diego has also done a bit of unisurgeon, uniportal surgery with a, a camera holder. And it is a very effective and actually I believe cost effective. Uh, some centers that have some limitations to staffing have gone forward with camera holders in quite a big way because it is actually extremely cost effective. So here you are, almost looking like a robotic operation, or half of a robotic operation, because you've got one wristed instrument, uh, and, uh, and away you go, in control of your, of your camera. Obviously, what does a robot give you? Well, it gives you 3D vision, and it gives you your instruments moving in the same direction, my hands still moving in the opposite direction of where I want the needle to go. But a nice uh, little demonstration that you don't have to have a robot to have wristed instrumentation. Now, as you can tell, uh, I did find some limitations to the Flexdex instruments, but these, the Art Essential instruments by Livsmed, really are fantastic because you can have them in both hands. They work like an absolute dream invented in South Korea. Uh, they are absolutely wonderful. So now suddenly I've got bilateral wristed instruments uh, and, uh, and this really does, to me, look a lot like a robotic operation. So with a freehand surgical a uh, camera holder and two of these in my hands, we're really getting very close to surgeon powered robotics being identical to normal robotics. So, so I've got a Maryland with bipolar uh, so instruments. Now, and this demonstrates a bit the advantage of this as well, because I've changed an instrument to a sucker. I've got tactile feedback going around this left upper lobe, anterior segmental pulmonary artery. Uh, and uh, and I'm by the bedside should I cause some kind of dramatic bleed. Don't worry, I don't think there is a bleed on this video. I've got plenty of videos that do, but not this one. But, uh, but that was like a real advantage. So I've got wristed instruments, I've got uh, the power of the camera in under control, and by the bedside I've got tactile feedback. It's cheaper by two million pounds, and, uh, and so there are a lot of advantages to, to surgeon-powered uh, robotics and, and here you can see you know doing a very similar operation to what would be done by standard that's all by by robotics with, with, with those wristed instruments so here's another video I just show I just show you a thymectomy I think these really are very good for for thymectomy uh, because in thymectomy you don't tend to change your instruments very much so I've got this is the right side of the chest I've got two flex decks, uh, sorry, two art essential Livsmed instruments. I've got the bipolar uh, precise dissector or Maryland dissector. I've got a bi blunt bipolar in the left hand, and uh, and it really is very nice uh, for for a thymectomy. Um, I'm using CO2, uh, and actually initially I used to use uh, my robotic ports because the art essential instruments are eight mils, but but more latterly I just make an eight mil hole in the chest. Uh, and use that uh, instead of a port. It is possible to get 8 mil ports. Um, uh, Allied Medical make them, and actually Artisential make a bespoke 8 mil port. But actually, I've found 
just making a small incision and pushing the instrument through the directly works perfectly well really and it does maintain CO2. CO2 is absolutely vital uh, if you're doing a um, if you're doing a thymectomy. So here we are at the bottom of the chest just getting all the fat off the diaphragm, a very important thing if you've got a patient with myasthenia, um, pulling all the fat off, off the diaphragm. And the real advantage of these wristed instruments actually comes when you go into the neck uh, because uh, doing a thymectomy in the neck you really do appreciate uh, instruments that can curve around and often curving around the right internal mammary vein and artery is quite advantageous. Um, I've also got a nice uh, 10 mil camera, I think I think I used a nice 10 mil, and then I quite often use a subsiphoid port when I do my VATS thymectomies. Um, so, so I have three ports on the right chest, a subsiphoid port to take the sample out and to have a little look at the phrenic, um, and, uh, and it works really nicely. So here's us going all the way over to the opposite side of the chest. So we're standing on the right side, going across to the left-hand side, and, uh, and these instruments that can reach over uh, really are quite nice. Now pulling, pulling it over into our view. Um, the alternative way, obviously, is straight stick surgery, and the other alternative is, is robotic surgery. Uh, robotic surgery sometimes is quite limited um, when you're on either the right or the left because you can't uh, hop the camera that easily. You're not by the bedside to do the instrument hopping either. So, so actually there certainly are some very significant advantages to getting yourself some wristed instruments and just standing by the bedside, having a sub port, uh, jumping around. Although having said that, our latest approach robotically is sub robotic where you put the robotic camera sub -ziphoid. And then you can look on the right side and the left side very nicely. Here's a good demonstration of the right angle uh, on the instrument, uh, which is really very good. And then we're going to start going up into the neck with these uh, wristed instruments. Well, that's enough of that. Let's have a talk about robotics. I'm sure that's what you want to hear about. And is it crazy the number of robots that are out there? So you may have heard of some of these. We'll probably tell you. Well, I will. I'm going to tell you about all of them. Uh, and, uh, and, and the really exciting thing about robotics these days is just the wide variety of options, the costs are crashing down, uh, it really is a very exciting time to be in robotic surgery. So let's just watch this quick video. Uh, this, vi I would say, is, is a unit of the future, but it's a unit of the present. Uh, this is a video from Southampton University Hospital, and just let's see what you think about this. So how cool is that? In Southampton right now today, uh, you can be doing intuitive surgery in one operating room and versus surgery in the other. So that's the new era. We have multiple platforms available for us to choose from, which is really outstanding. So let's tell you a little bit more about versus surgery. So versus surgery has a nice uh, wide variety of instruments. 
This is some of the early work we did uh, on the verses in a cadaveric lab. So you've got uh, multiple arms that you can place anywhere around the patient, which is really great. The camera is 10 mils. It's nice and light. You can detach it and use it as an endoscopic camera. And all the rest are 5 mil, uh, which is really, really exciting. So, so they're 5 mil instruments, and so they're much smaller. And the other advantage is you can use your own ports. So these are allied medical ports. You can use any ports you like, really. But you're not stuck to the, the, the company's ports. This is the super clever thing. When you insert the instrument, how does it know where the remote center is, where to not move on the skin? Well, the answer is you just wiggle it round in a circle and the software of the system lets you know when it's decided where the remote center is and it will now keep that place completely still. How cool is that? Ta-da! Um, the other really cool thing is that these are five mils, so actually a little bit of movement of the patient isn't the world's worst thing. It is in intuitive because they're stuck super rigid, but not for versus. The hand controls are also extremely innovative. They look like Xbox controllers, but you can do absolutely everything with them. So no longer do you have your two most important digits uh, controlling the opening and closing, you only have your index finger. So we freed up your thumb for two joysticks, and that means you can control your, your uh, camera with it, and there's a whole load of buttons. So there's no foot buttons at all. And the big advantage of not having foot buttons is you can stand up if you want, you don't have to, uh, but the uh, surgeon console can be raised all the way to standing. So here's myself fully gowned and scrubbed with two gloves so that if there was an emergency I can take one set off and go straight to the bedside, uh, which I think you know is quite nice. Quite a lot of surgeons also quite enjoyed uh, doing a standing up surgery because they feel more connected to their team. You'll also find most other platforms these days have gone to 3D screens rather than the periscope option of intuitive uh, and it seems to work very nicely. You just wear some goggles uh, and, uh, and it just makes you feel more connected. Obviously having a periscope like intuitive means you then have to have a microphone to be able to talk to your team. So, so most other platforms have gone to this and I, I suspect the fifth generation intuitive system will also go down this direction. So let's have a look in a bit more detail about exactly how you do a Versius uh, robotic lobectomy. So this is the other team in the UK who have Versius. Papworth have full access to Versius every single day now. Uh, and this is what their 2023 version looks like. Uh, four arms, and I'll just show you about setup. So they're very quick and easy to bring forwards. Obviously I've sped it up a bit, but it is quick and easy to bring them to the bedside. We use all the same port positionings of an intuitive operation and probably be the same for all robots really because they're just the best place for robotic ports. So camera in the middle, eight space, two at the back, one at the front and the assistant port at the bottom. Uh, you then bring in your arms and dock them with the five mil instruments. You'll do your remote centering by just wiggling them round and round and then they're ready to go. Off you go. You only do that once when you uh, do the first docking so you can take things in and out. You don't have to do it every single time. Uh, and, and you're ready to go. The camera obviously needs it as well. Four arms, two at the back, one at the front, five mils, remember, not eight mils, and lots and lots of space for an assistant. So here we are inside. We've got the uh, our third arm to do retracting. You've got your Maryland in your right hand. You've got a grasp in the left. Uh, and, uh, and as well as the Maryland with bipolar, you've got uniportal, you've got a unipolar hook, and you've got monopolar um, scissors as well, if you like. Um, this grasper is you know, quite blunt, quite safe. We've now retracted the right upper lobe down and we're going to take out some R10 lymph nodes. Then we're going above the azygous, taking some R4 lymph nodes. And really the hope of showing you this video is to show how easy it all looks. This is what the console looks like. Uh, Adam Perrett here was sitting down for this one. You can do whatever you like. But he did feel certainly very connected to his team. Uh, we're now going forward to expose the right upper lobe vein. Uh, here is the right upper lobe vein. Here's this lovely blunt instrument going around the vein. Very, very safe indeed. You'll also notice the screen looks very different for Versius uh, because we don't number them because uh, they're not in a fixed order. You can put your bedside units in any order you like. So, 
So they're actually color coded uh, pink, uh, green, uh, mauve, etc., or orange. Um, and uh, so here's the, us now going around the truncal branch. Um, the other thing you'll see is some little half moon circles to the side of the round icons. These indicate whether you fully wound uh, the instruments in a circle, and it can automatically unwind these for you. Uh, and it's got a, a camera orientation at the bottom. So really uh, a very nice way to do an operation. Obviously you have to have an assistant doing the stapling, uh, but you know, that's, that's how we used to do it with an SI. Um, it's actually how you have to do it with several other novel uh, robotic platforms, including the single port robot by Intuitive as well. So it's not that big a deal. It's actually a lot cheaper if you can use any stapler you like. I know quite a lot of intuitive surgeons in America that are using bedside stapling to save money. Um, and so here we are, we've completed a right upper lobectomy, uh, very nicely indeed, uh, without any problems or issues with the Versus system. So here's the right upper lobe coming out. And, uh, and uh, there we are, well done Adam Perrett, what a great job kicking off the Versus robotic program in Patworth to turn them into fully robotic surgeons uh, from 2023 onwards. So this is really fantastic. You get a load of data collected and then you get your phone, you get a QR code at the end of your procedure and then you go and bit the QR code. So that was Alessandro Tamburini, uh, the other surgeon in Southampton, downloading completely all the information for the operation immediately onto his phone, including everything that the Versus rep had put in. So, so all the port positions, all the details of the operation, anything that went well or went less well uh, is all collected instantly, no delays whatsoever. Really, really innovative from Cambridge Medical Robotics, a British company. And here is something else super cool uh, with CMR. So before you even get your system, uh, you'll be sent VR headsets. You'll be sent about eight of them. Your whole team can take them home and learn how to set up the whole robotic system before it even arrives in your hospital, which saves loads and loads of time uh, getting your program up and into action. Yes, do it in a room where someone isn't videoing you because you're going to look pretty silly. Uh, but in, in your front room, you can do this for hours and hours as long as you like at home. The other really cool thing is you can sit down on the simulator now as well. So as a surgeon, you can do as many hours of simulation as you like to get really, really good with the hand controls. I think this is an absolutely wonderful innovation from CMR Surgical. So now let's show you a few other versus operations. And this is Patrick Bagan in Paris. And he did a sub xiphoid thymectomy, which I absolutely love. He, in fact, showed me this, which I then took on because I was so impressed. So a single Alexis port sub xiphoid with CO2, one five mil instrument in the left chest, one five mil instrument in the right chest. Uh, and then look at the phenomenal view you get from sub -ziphoid. It's just perfect. You get to see the left phrenic, which you just saw very nicely. You get to see the right phrenic. Um, you get to see up into the neck. Uh, and actually, I think now this should be the default uh, approach for thymectomy. When you ever, whenever you ask a surgeon, how do you do your thymectomies? They're always either, well, I do the left or, well, I do the right. The disadvantage is always the opposite phrenic. Uh, so, so this fixes that problem. Uh, and uh, so here's us looking at the opposite chest, looking at the right phrenic. Uh, and then you don't have any problems looking up into the neck because it's such a direct view straight up into the neck. The other really good thing we've now done as well is we sometimes use laryngeal masks or we use a single lumen tube uh, with some injection into the cord. So we don't use any muscle relaxant whatsoever. So this is really good for myasthenics so without muscle relaxant. Um, and simpler and quicker, the, the anaesthetic takes literally 10 minutes to get this patient into the room, which is really helpful. So, um, uh, and this also, just have a little nose, this is uh, a proximity case. So I was actually remote telementoring for this case. I was at home uh, watching this and uh, interacting with the staff. Interestingly, 
uh, Guys and Tommies are offering a six-week proximity immersion to their operating where you'll watch uh, Tom Routledge and Andreas Bile and Leanne all doing operations uh, on proximity, being able to interact, ask questions uh, from the comfort of your own home. So that's pretty exciting. Another fabulous innovation and outcomes. The thymus through the sub -zifoid, any size port, and the final view. There you go. You can see both sides. There's the anominate vein. There's the aorta and the end of the operation. Great job, Patrick Bagan, and a lovely thymectomy done there. Well done to him and his team. So we're getting pretty much into remote telementoring in mid-COVID. And so this is myself, remote telementoring, uh, Mike Wilson and the team in Australia. Uh, slightly tediously, they said, when are you free, mate? And I said, well, whenever you're operating is between 11 p.m. and 6 a.m. my time, so I'm always free. So this was two in the morning. Uh, but they decided they'd like to do a diaphragm placation uh, with the Versus, and here they go. So, and it was a really, really good approach. So, so using CO2 pushes the diaphragm down. Uh, you need one bedside unit as far to the left as possible, one as far to the right as possible, uh, and then off you go. Just doing a whole load of, uh, of horizontal mattress sutures that were pledgeted. So they had their bedside assistants, and they actually had um, a a core knot suturing device, which helped a lot as well. Uh, and then just a, a long line of horizontal mattress sutures. Um, so it seemed to work really nicely. Uh, this was the, the first versus operation in Australia, actually. Uh, and, and all went really very nicely. The setup again was great uh, and a uh, really nice job from the guys there. So what's this? Well, in terms of innovation, we've taken Joe Zacharias to a cadaveric lab and done the sub -zifoid approach uh, to look into beamer harvest. Uh, and uh, I think it was pretty successful. So obviously this is not a living person, but you can see uh, the left internal mammary arteries are being skeletonized here. Really very successfully, I thought, and, and, and Joe Zac agreed. So we've done seven uh, of these. Uh, one person had already had CABG, so there was only a REMA to do. Uh, and, uh, and and it worked really well. The really nice thing with the sub -zifoid is we could come distally as far as we liked and then literally you could virtually reach into the test and chest and put a clip in and test uh, that, that it was bleeding uh, through that sub -zifoid port, uh, which was really nice. So, so watch this space, intuitive and not very positive at all about cardiac robotics, but uh, versus are becoming increasingly positive. So we may actually you know, find that uh, other robotic companies become the primary robotic platforms in cardiac surgery going forwards. Just to let you know how Versus are getting on in the, in, in the, in the world, this was their first write-up. They have a, an amazing registry of every single patient. They've now done 10,000 uh, Versus operations across over 100 platforms worldwide. Uh, and in thoracic surgery, in this write-up, they've done about 120, although it's now uh, way more than that, it's in the 300. So they're whizzing along very nicely. Um, there have been a few rumours about how closely they're getting connected to um, Johnson & Johnson. Uh, and, and some of the inside chat is that Johnson & Johnson may at some stage make a bid to buy them versus is worth four billion at the moment. Uh, but Johnson & Johnson is worth a lot more. So, And then the Johnson & Johnson robotic programme, I visited the Verb Surgical first go. Uh, in 2018, which then collapsed. Um, their second go was called Ottava, uh, and I believe that has also now stopped. So they actually have no robotic program at the moment. So, so it does make a lot of sense to Johnson Johnson to buy a pre-existing platform. And, and actually, I think that would be a good thing uh, for CMR. I think they'll be able to develop stapling and advanced energy very quickly in combination with them. So but we, we don't know. Let's watch this space for that. So what about uniportal robotic surgery, something very close to my heart. In 2016, I went to Orsi to try out the SI Singapore system, but you didn't know that existed. Uh, well, if you look on the far left there, you can see they had a load of curved cannulae and a load of curved instruments. Uh, and, and you could actually achieve uh, an operation through a uniportal SI robotic system. So we had a bit of a go at in cadaveric labs, animal labs and boxes like this, but we didn't feel confident enough to take this all the way to a patient. Then in 
2018 uh, verse the intuitive took me to uh, California uh, where we tried this out and Diego uh, went as well and it was absolutely amazing the single port robot is phenomenal we did subxiphoid uniportal surgery on the right on the left thymectomy it was absolutely brilliant it's got these incredible three wristed arms that come out of one port. It's got a snake camera that can look around vessels uh, and, and really is just an amazing system. And, and I'm completely in love with it, frankly. Uh, so and this is just the icon bottom right. Of it. it shows you where all your arms are. And, uh, and really, it felt like being on a multi-portal robot. This is a video from, Wei, from Yin Kai Chao in Taiwan. Um, and, uh, and he has commenced a program of uniportal single port robotics. Now, he just put a five mile port for the first few cases so he could document and watch uh, the inside of his subcostal incision. But he disposed of that for his subsequent cases. So he does a subcostal incision, a bit like Carel Flirty that you saw a bit earlier. Um, he then puts in this very clever new Alexis style port that Intuitive have invented. Uh, and the, the early trials showed that you had to go 12 centimeters into the chest before you could deploy your instruments. But now they've invented this, that 12 centimeters can occur outside the chest. So that has got rid of that disadvantage. So now basically it's ready to go. So here is the incredible single port robot. Um, here's the camera going in, the snake camera. Uh, and then here come the uh, amazing uh, wristed instruments, well, sort of snake instruments, really. You can have three of them. And this is Yin Kai Chao in Taiwan doing a live patient. Uh, this is the uh, subcarinal station uh, being dissected out absolutely beautifully with a monopolar scissors. I'm always slightly je jealous of the Asian anatomy, which is always amazing with phenomenal fissures and no adhesions. Uh, and, uh, and then here is uh, Yin Kai Chao getting around uh, the the vein, getting around the right upper lobe vein, uh, getting a sling round. They don't have a stapler for the single port robot at the moment, so you can still use any stapler you like. They actually have a stapling port designed in this port, and here's the assistant bringing the stapler in. They actually take out one of the three arms just to make a bit more st space, uh, and then they bring in the stapler, just like a versus operation, or just like an SI operation. Uh, so, so, and then, uh, there they go, and then this is round an anterior uh, pulmonary segmental branch, again using the uh, Cavidian tristapler here, and then getting around the main truncal branch. And you know, if I showed you just the inside pictures, you wouldn't think this was a uniportal operation, because all the arms are kind of coming from the sides. I remember there's a third arm in there doing the retraction, which which is just out of view, which is just so useful, and. Um, you know, I really am blown away by this as a procedure. Uh, of note, Blair Marshall is also doing this for single port subxiphoid thymectomy at the Brigham and Women's, and she's doing an FDA approved trial in this, uh, as well as the Taiwan group doing uh, lobectomy. So, you know, there's a lot of innovation going on in single port robotics. You just saw at the top right there the 3D reconstruction tile probe into the system, and, and here's the right upper lobectomy beautifully performed. Uh, and so at the end, you've got your one drain through the subcostal, not going between intercostal spaces, not banging intercostal nerves. Uh, there's the final look. And, uh, and here you go. So you can see this is a later case. So, so there was no five mil port higher up because that was just done initially. And, uh, and that's what the final look uh, looks like. So it's really exciting. And I actually went out to visit Yin Kai Chao uh, and their amazing innovative team uh, and, and watched everything that, that, that they are up to, which is great. And they've now done 50 uh, thoracic cases, which is really incredible. Uh, so well done to them. Uh, so, so yes, I'm obsessed with uniportal robotics. Now, the bad thing is I don't have 800,000 quid for the single port robot, which isn't CU marked anyway in Europe. So, so here's next in the next video what, what we've been up to with uniportal robotics in the uk
today and tomorrow we're extremely lucky. We've got Diego Gonzalez Rivas, the most famous thoracic surgeon in the world, who's come to teach us a brand new technique. And he's created a new technique literally in the last six months to fuse robotic surgery with what he does, which is single incision uniportal surgery. What we've normally done in the past is five incisions in the chest, but he can do what we do with five with just one. And the whole mission of this is to make it less painful, quicker recovery for our patients. Since September 2021, I started to think how to adjust this robot through a single incision. We uh, cancel one arm, and by using only three arms with the, with the help of the assistant, we can do the robotic surgery through a single hole without the need of more incisions. So that means that we created a, a new approach, less invasive, with the robotic uh, help. So it's fantastic. We've got Diego at the bedside and we've got a lovely lady who has uh, multiple uh, pulmonary mets and we're going to remove, uh, we hope probably four of them. We've labelled three nodules, but Diego with his magic finger has managed to identify the fourth nodule, which is absolutely brilliant. So we've, uh, in the end, uh, resected five suspicious areas. We did a hybrid approach, really, of, uh, of robotic, and then also we did some VAT stapling. So difficult case in the end, but we managed to get the lungs now nicely inflated, and we're going to close up and I hope she'll make a good recovery. So, surgery day, initially I went in to a scanner where all my tumours that they were going to take out were marked with a day glow dye so that when they come to do the operation they can actually see what they're doing. Three of them were marked up. They actually took five out, so I was delighted when I came round and I was told that, so that's all good. I would imagine that if somebody had told me I was going to have lung surgery and have five different areas of my lungs cut out and three different loads, I would have thought I'd be out cold for ages. But actually, I was at the same day, I was walking around. Yeah, I've been, I've been fine. I'm really pleased with the recovery. I think we will benefit from, from this approach for sure in all the region. So, Uniportal Robotics with our standard uh, XI Intuitive fourth generation system is here. So, uh, Diego invented this when he was bored in COVID uh, in September 2021. Already he's done over 300 operations and, you know, just doing them every single day. It's incredible uh, what he's doing. And, uh, and together with him, uh, a group of us have done a couple of editions of the Annals of Chiropractic Surgery, all about Uniportal Robotic Surgery, how to do it. Uh, I've got, we've got an atlas of every single lobe uh, and hints and tips and things. And, uh, and what is my experience of uniportal robotics with the intuitive? Well, my experience is that uh, it's obviously you've just got uh, two working arms. You need a very good surgeon by the bedside. So it's actually a two surgeon approach. Um, the person at the bedside has to know what you're doing so that it can retract for you uh, and also uh, and it's very helpful just to have someone who knows how to do a lobectomy. So the way it really fits in is to be quick and efficient. It's so quick to set it up. Literally one incision, bang them in. Uh, the setup time is super fast and you can get out super fast. So, so I kind of still do my multi-portal robotics for, for sort of big detailed cases. And then if I want to sneak a quick third lobectomy on or a, a wedge and lymph nodes, then, then maybe I'll do uniportal in that situation where everyone's like, oh my God, you can't do three. But well, actually you'd go, don't worry, I'll do it uniportal. And it'll be a bit quicker. And the team go, oh, phew, that's great. So, so that's where we're, we've landed with the uniportal robotics. And then the more you do sort of small procedures, the more you know how the slightly more advanced procedures might go uh, in that way. And training up your bedside stuff. You can staple uh, with it, so, so it's really great. But Diego's been doing double sleeves uh, and all sorts of things with it. So, you know, the sky's the limit uh, with this uh, idea. 
Just one important note on Uniportal Robotics is that it's not actually supported by Intuitive. It's an off-label indication. Now, why is that? Well, uh, the reason is something called capacitive coupling. Uh, something that they've looked into in extreme detail, especially with their single port robot. Um, the situation is if you've got a monopolar device and you've got a, a metal cannula which is, goes through something plastic or through air, then you can build up charge uh, in that monopolar device. And if another device comes along and touches it, you could then get discharge of that into tissues. And that discharge into tissues could be a sucker that then discharges remote where you're not even watching it. So they're particularly worried about this in the abdomen where you could get a bowel injury. Um, I guess in the chest, um, a little bit of burning on, on the periphery of the lung isn't going to be life-threatening. But, but actually, even so, uh, they, that's the reason they don't support uniportal robotics. That's actually, interestingly, if you either use the TORS ports and grounded them because they're ENT ports in the air, that's how they got around it in ENT, um, or if you use bipolar energy, that does get around this issue completely. So it is just good to know about something like this if you're going to embark on on a UniPortal robotic program with Intuitive. So this is the current 2023 uh, layout of my operating room. So I've got a hybrid CT scanner in my operating room. I've got the XI ready for my UniPortal surgery. I've got two consoles uh, and I've got an iPad to tar pro my 3D reconstruction into the chest so we can rotate it on the screen and see it uh, as we tar pro in to do our segmentectomy. Uh, so why do I have a, a hybrid CT scanner interoperatively in my operating room? Well, that's because quite often now, with, uh, with the approaches we're using, um, we are having to label our nodules. And I used to have to send them down into the CT scanner, but now I can bring them in and I can do a navigational bronchoscopy. I do like, however, the CT scanner to make sure my needle is perfectly in the right place. And so this is us doing that navigational bronchoscopy with the 3D CT scanner. This is another procedure. Um, this is Ben, my brilliant registrar. So he goes in, that green dot on the far screen there is the nodule we want labeling. He gets it, he hits it, and then we inject 0.3 mils of ICG. Uh, we then take out the bronchoscope. We do a spin, uh, leaving the needle in place. Uh, to prove we've got exactly where we want to be. Now, you probably don't need the 3D CT scan if you're ICG labeling, because it is very reliable and accurate. But the reason we're doing it is so that we can also get good at biopsy and we can also get good at uh, the future, which is going to be ablation. We actually bought the ablation device already, and we're hoping to move towards that in the next six months, because that is going to be a massive future for all of us, uh, is going towards ablation for small uh, nodules that we have got tissue on already. So how about this for innovation? This is something that just blows my mind. This is the latest operating room in Shanghai. So that's a patient. Here's another patient, and then there's two more patients in the distance as well. So this is one operating room uh, with four patients being operated on at the same time. Now, I was horrified by this initially, but actually this makes so much sense. The real advantage in Shanghai of why they're such a great unit is because all the surgeons wander around, seeing each other's operating, giving advice. They're there for emergencies. They can sense when somebody's having a difficult time. And actually, what a great way to actually have them in the same room together. I don't think there's going to be an infection risk. They're all clean cases, aren't they? So if there's no infection risk, then, then what is the disadvantage of having them all in a big, long room? And actually, it helps for anesthesia. They can help and share it with each other. It helps a lot with efficiency. Now, I don't think this is ever going to happen in the NHS, but actually, it makes more sense when you, the more you think about it. So do have a think about it. See what you think about uh, multi-patient operating theatres. Let's talk about some of the other robotic platforms, perhaps. There's a whole load of them out there. Uh, and the next big player, I believe, is going to be Medtronic. Uh, it used to be called Einstein, but they changed it to Hugo. Don't know what. Um, and we've been waiting for this for a long time. I actually went out to Geneva. 
where they were innovating this in 2018. They were telling me, yes, we're just about to launch in 2018. Uh, the team showed it to me in Geneva. They even gave me the Medtronic robotic socks because they were quite grossed out by surgeons taking their shoes off to press the buttons. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, we waited and we waited and we waited. But finally, it is here. So, so this is the wonderful console. It really is a great console. It's got a lovely pistol grip. It's actually got a second kind of iPad on the side, just like my operating room, but fully integrated into the system. So all you see on the screen is your operation. Uh, interesting, if you look away with these glasses, it knows you're looking away and it locks the instruments. And then on that iPad screen at the side, you can have your 3D reconstructions, you have all your controls. Uh, so, you know, it really is a good uh, instrument for, for the surgeon console. As I've shown you there, the, uh, the console is there to do all sorts of things, to do rotation scaling, to do uh, uh, overlay, all sorts of things. Really, really nice to have it separate to the main screen. The pistol grip control is wonderful, absolutely love it. Again, you only open and close with your index finger, which frees up your thumb for a series of things. So, so lovely, beautifully designed. And the instrument arms, the, the bedside units, they're quite a lot bigger than the Versus bedside units, but they actually have quite a lot of reach as well. So I think it'll, let's see how they, how they get on in thoracic surgery. I think they will be successful and I think they will be able to do a really good job of thoracic surgery as well. Now the big thing uh, for Medtronic is everything that Medtronic has. So it's got our Covidian tri-stapler, it's got Ligasure. So they tell me this will come. Now they're not here yet, they're not CE marked, uh, they don't have the stapler ready to go, they don't have the Ligasure ready to go, but they will. There's no chance that they won't in three years time, five years time, two years time, who knows? Uh, and then imagine that, a, a, a brilliant Medtronic robot with, with our favourite stapler and our favourite energy device. It will be hopefully really fantastic. And they're already having a think about where the uh, bedside units might go. Um, and again, they can just learn from Versius because they probably should go exactly where Versius go. I'm sure the ports will get in the same place as well. So, so it will be successful. Um, the other real big advantage, of course, is if it's Medtronic, uh, Medtronic uh, supplies so many things to hospitals. And I've already heard that uh, the very big customers of Medtronic in Europe have already been offered free robots uh, as long as they maintain their, their customers. There are things called MedPoints, which are Medtronic points, and you build them up uh, by use of Medtronic things. Remember, uh, pacemakers are Medtronic, $15,000 CRT are Medtronic, uh, you know, loads and loads of non-robotic things are Medtronic. So you can build up these med points and they give you free robots. So that's going to be a massive advantage to the market. And I think we'll see that more and more. And that's probably why Johnson & Johnson will want to get a robot as well, so that their equivalent uh, with Ethicon will be able to build up the ability to pay for free robots. And my question is always, you know, could you go uniportal? And, and we, we had a go in this plastic lab, and it looks like you probably would be able to as well. So, so the, the instruments are sort of sufficiently far away from, from the patient that they don't clash too much. Uh, but we'll wait and see. So this was just my little... A slide on Johnson & Johnson. So I went to go and visit their team in 2018 uh, with the Verb surgery link up. Uh, it kind of went a bit funny, the Verb Johnson & Johnson link up, because Verb was so innovative. They were basically Google. This was in Google Building 1, uh, and they had such far-visioned uh, sort of ideas. They had ideas to use the multilingual translation to do remote telementoring in multi-language. They, I actually personally watched um, an automated docking system where it would use a clever little infrared to find where the ports were and it would dock it itself. I actually saw a 3D screen where you didn't need goggles. It was like unbelievable. It could track which was your left and your right eye. So they had so much innovation, but I think uh, somehow they just didn't get into the market. Oh, the, the arms came out the table as well, which was phenomenal. Uh, but that broke down and... Uh, 
As you can see by the right-handed screenshot, they're working on a system called Otava. Uh, but again, I have heard that that has, after a billion pounds of use, uh, that has now ceased in innovation. So I think the space for Johnson & Johnson will be the acquisition of another company. So, and I, 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 so watch this space. I think within six months to a year, we'll hear something more on that. There are lots of other companies. So Dexter has a in-clinical use uh, robot. It's got two five mil instruments uh, and a camera. And uh, yeah, it kind of looks interesting. I have talked to a surgeon that's used it. It does have some significant limitations, but you know, it works. Um, and it has two five mil instruments and a camera. And, uh, and you stand, you, you have a console. So we'll see. Um, I, I'm slightly skeptical. It might not be that useful for thoracics. It might be better for minor procedures in general surgery. There was a company called Avatera, uh, and they're a German company, and they have uh, developed this, uh, which you know looks quite a lot like a, a, an, an XI, and uh, but but you know they'll all look fairly similar to, to each other, um, and uh, and this is also in clinical use. I haven't yet heard of anyone uh, using it in thoracics, but I have heard of plenty of people using it in in abdominal surgery. So watch this space for Avatera, especially in Europe. Actually, the Senhart system has been in use for quite a few years. Imperial College bought one, uh, and uh, and I know of a surgeon uh, in in Germany who has used it. Um, the concept of it was that it's a hybrid system where it holds a series of VATS instruments, um, and so and it has a wristed needle holder and then other VATS instruments, sort of. Uh, that that is also its big disadvantage so so most of the instruments are not wristed so so at the current point of of looking at it i looked it up on the on the stocks and shares market and it lost 62 million in one quarter uh, and actually uh, had started talking to russian hospitals about trying to get them the system which which i'm not sure is a great thing but uh, but so so i'm not sure that senhartz will be around for much longer but but you never know they might be able to develop their systems and create better uh, wristed instruments, but you, but you never know. Let's watch that space. Enos by Titan Medical have been around for quite a while. Uh, I hear they have been acquired by a larger company as well, and their concept was also a uniportal system. They just have two instruments, not three, uh, and I don't think they're in current, current clinical use, uh, but they've been certainly looking uh, to find a buyer or, or get a buyer. I love the idea of this uh, instrument. It's called uh, Vicarious Surgical, and they have this amazing 3D uh, concept where you use a VR headset to control the instrumentation. Uh, and uh, it does look a lot like the single port robotic system. Again, two arms, not three. Uh, might be good for a minor procedures, but you know, it might be interesting. So, so watch this space for Vicarious Surgical Systems. And uh, what does this look like? Well, uh, this has been invented uh, in India, uh, the, the Mudra endosurgical uh, system. Uh, it's got uh, four bedside units. It looks a little bit like uh, Versus, but then actually the header end uh, has the pen holding grip, much like an intuitive system. So a long range of instruments, as you can see top right, and, and I hear certainly in India, this is going well. I don't think it's C-marked or FDA approved yet, but uh, certainly could be something that we might see some videos from India in, in the future. Also, when I was in South Korea, I visited the Revo Eye and sat on this system. Uh, this looks very like an intuitive system. It actually looked like, exactly like an SI. Um, it's super similar. Uh, and uh, uh, talking to the surgeons out there, um, there haven't been that many sold in, in South Korea. There'd be maybe four sold, and they'd sold a few into China. So, so I'm not sure that we're going to see much of this system. It did seem to be being mothballed uh, when I visited South Korea to look at it. So that's some of the systems, but there's massive revolution also going on in training. So with remote telementoring, clinical immersions, community mentoring, artificial intelligence, you know, the actual training platform system is rocketing along at a huge speed.
This is myself doing remote tele-mentoring. This is the first ever Versius operation in the world in Chemnitz, but it was in COVID lockdown, so I couldn't go there. So, so I tele-mentored uh, Sven Seifert from my, my table, from my kitchen table, uh, which worked really, really well. And this is uh, the Vuzix system. We've got this in our hospitals called Rods and Cones. You can actually do a, a robotic immersion in our hospital one-to-one -one with you sit on your laptop. We video it and we can chat via this headset. I've got an earphones in it. I've actually got a little uh, screen in my headphones so you can actually post questions. And interestingly, Guys and Tommies are doing a Proximy Immersion uh, series uh, that you can actually log into right now if you log on to Guys and Tommies and look for robotic proximity uh, immersion. We're doing something called the Mastery Trial, collecting 500 cases of all our robotic operations. And the intention of doing this is to create a scoring system. So every operation you do, you get a score back. And the idea is to work on where are your strengths, where are your weaknesses, do you need help? And also to post examples of the best operations online. And this will be massive in the future. No longer will you just knock off an operation and hope they survive. You'll be getting scored for every single operation you do in the future. And every single company is working on this. So Medtronic, um, Johnson & Johnson, Intuitive are all rocketing towards metrics for their robotic operations because they know this will make safer surgery. The CSAT system, interestingly, even though they haven't got a robot, is the Johnson & Johnson offering. They already right now today, um, if you upload a video into their system, they'll score it out of 25 in five different areas. They'll segment it up into different parts of it, tell you the timings. Here's a screenshot of the five different areas by manual dexterity, depth perception, efficiency, force sensitivity, and robotic control. You'll get a score. It's currently being scored by people, uh, by crowdsourcing of 18 year olds all doing it after being trained. But very soon their AI is going to do the scoring. The other massive thing on the left is they sent this, they send this to uh, experts. I'm actually registered for this. And you'll be sent a video, you'll be asked to watch it, and we get given $50 and we write a report. So you'll get a, a full mentor report on your operation so if you're a new consultant you can still get advice on how to improve through this brilliant CSATS uh, website which is in current use right now today you can also get all your metrics you can see your times as they drop And there's this wonderful repository. There's 40,000 intuitive robotic operations on this system, which blows my mind. But, uh, but it really actually exists right now today. So check it out at csats.com. We've created a whole load of train the trainer programs for Versius and, uh, and we've linked up with general surgery and all other surgeries so that we can be better trainers for you as well. And Da Vinci have now created the first new trainees registrar residence training program. And I believe Ben Waterhouse, my trainee, is the first person to receive a certificate. And, and Ollie, uh, who's now uh, just been appointed a consultant in Southampton, is the second person to get a certificate that says they can be an intuitive consultant when they become a consultant. So watch out for their fellowship training program. So there's loads of innovation, there's loads of tele-mentoring. Uh, we tele-mentored Australia, as you can see here. And we've tele-mentored Africa. So this was the first ever robotic thoracic operation done uh, in, in Africa uh, with the SI using some tele-mentoring. We turned up as well for a bit. Uh, and so, so, you know, it really is an exciting world, an exciting time to be involved in robotics, uh, which is really, really exciting and great. So that's everything from me. Um, so thank you very much for, for sticking it out to the end. Maybe you had no choice or maybe you're bored, but thanks for sticking out to the end. Um, I'm now full editor of CTSnet, so if you've got a video uh, of uh, your operation, please do send it to us. We have a very, very open uh, editorial system. Basically, we'll say yes. Uh, and actually, very shortly, we'll also be able to pass them on to journals so you can then get a full peer-reviewed uh, thumbs up and get it published as well. So you'll get a double bang for your buck. So send us your videos right now. We'll pass them on to journals who'll publish them. And uh, let's all learn together. Thank you very much for your attention.